Well, firstly, let me thank you for that uh, really nice welcome. Um, and it's obviously uh, great to be back and great to be given the opportunity to, uh, to sort of give you another presentation. So good evening to everybody out there. I know these times are a little bit difficult, but this hopefully will make things that little bit easier. And it will give you an opportunity as well to kind of um, see my journey as a photographer. And I'm going to give you some insights into how I came about to become a, a minimalist photographer. So obviously minimalism is, is something that's been around for a long, long time. It's nothing new. Um, it's not a particular genre of photography that I like to be put into. Um, I prefer to be called a fine art photographer. But um, there is an element of, of simplicity to my work. So we're really gonna just run through that journey of, um, of, of how I came about to become this type, this type of photographer. But we're going to start with um, an actual quotation, if it actually works. Just bear with me. I can't, actually, uh, I can't actually move the presentation onto the next slide, my friend, so I'm not sure if we can... Oh, here we go. There we go. So the first, the, the first uh, slide is, is a quotation from a very famous black and white photographer who unfortunately has passed now, but um, you may well know of him. Henry Cartier-Bresson, very famous indeed. And um, his, his quotation, and he said many quotations, but one of the most, one of the ones that sticks with me really is, is your first 10,000 photographs are your worst. And that sounds like quite a harsh thing to say. It, it's almost sort of saying that if you don't um, take 10,000 photographs, or you've even taken 5,000 or 2,000 or 10 in your life, that you're not a very good photographer. And that's not really the message. Um, there's, a, there's a deeper message than that. And it doesn't necessarily make you a, a better photographer either if you have taken more than 10,000. But what we are gonna do is we're gonna revisit this particular quote at the end of the session, once we've gone through what I've done in my journey to kind of work out maybe what the answer is to this question. So we're gonna start off with a little bit of background really on, on who I am and so you know where it all started. Um, so even as a child, I kind of loved art. I was lucky to go to galleries. I was very lucky to go to places like uh, the, the Alps in, uh, in France and Switzerland, as well as the Lake District in Scotland. So this kind of gave me a, a big appreciation of, of big wide open spaces. Um, but my education kind of followed that route because I was kind of quite into art and I wanted to do something with it. But my, my first interaction really was, was design. And I started in art and design at college uh, and then quickly moved on from that into university to study furniture and product design. So a lot of the linear, simplistic sort of uh, style that I kind of have is it goes all the way back to my university days. Um, and you can see that these particular Bauhaus um, guys at the top, so you've got a Van der Rohe chair at the top which was a Bauhaus piece, uh, as well as a Mears van der Rohe in the middle and a Stark at the bottom. This is very simplistic design, and that's the kind of design that I loved at college, and it's kind of flowed through really into my later life. So um, you'll see again in my work as well how this influences me. So my first real passion was black and white photography. Um, you might recognize some of these guys. Uh, Amstel Adams, obviously top left. Uh, Michael Kenner, bottom left, very sort of minimalist himself. And uh, another chap, uh, English guy called Nick Brandt, who used to uh, produce videos, music videos, like Michael Jackson and people like that. But he went into wildlife photography and did a very good job of it as well. And this kind of dodging and burning technique was something that really caught my eye, um, whether it would be in the, the dark room or whether it would be digitally. And that's what these guys did a lot of. They did a lot of monotone dodging and burning to really make that contrast pop. So I kind of picked up a camera about 17 years ago. Um, I, I would say more as a hobby at first. Um, yes, I'd taken sort of shots as a child on cheap Kodak cameras and things like that, but you know, I didn't start taking it really seriously until the digital age in about 2001. Um, so my first sort of images really were, were always black and white. And this is a far cry from what I'd normally do now, but it's one of my first images in about 2002. And this shows a, a young bull in the field and it caught my eye as I was driving past. And um, the backlighting of that particular bull as well kind of 
struck out. Yeah, technical assistant will work with you. Did you get it? Did you get it? So we've got someone on. Uh, was that a question? Apologies, I wasn't no, sure. I, I did mute it. I did mute it. Please continue. Oh, no worries. Okay, no worries. So then I kind of like started to explore a little bit more in relation to um, the landscape because obviously the landscape when I was a child was a big was a big influence on me. So I'd go to places like Scotland. Uh, this is Glencoe in Scotland. Again, there's a little element of simplicity in this shop, but. More the black and white sort of uh, influence was was what I was trying to achieve. I was trying to achieve a black and white monotone feel by dodging and burning, and you know having a singular subject that would pop against that dark background. And then this continued into uh, other landscapes. I wasn't doing any long exposure at this point, which I, I did in a later later on in my sort of career in life, but. Um, initially, I was just looking at uh, water, um, big influence on me even when I was younger. Um, but moodiness and emotion was starting to creep into the work a bit more. And I wanted to try to achieve that rather than just a, a lovely vista. I wanted to try to achieve emotional connection rather than just location connection, um, even in my sort of earlier stuff. So all of it's black and white, as you can still see. Um, and this one, again, Lake District in the UK. Um, I mean, none of these are great photographs, but obviously when you first start taking images, you're, you're learning as a creator. You're learning how to use your tools. You're, you're, you know, you're quickly evolving as well um, and learning new techniques. And then simplicity, simplicity starts to appear a bit more in my portfolio. So um, you know, the square crop was a sort of Hasselblad kind of uh, feel. I wanted to try to emulate that and give people a, a feel of, um, a, a, of balance as well with the square crop with this image. And this was actually a, a storm um, which was just starting to build at sunset and it was very very simple indeed you can, I'm not sure if you can see it on your monitor but it's just a very single post on top of a hill with some birds um, I, think they were, I think they were ravens or something like that just kind of like munching away on the farmer's field and then this was my first image that won me an award um, so back in about 2004 and uh, my first award was for practical photography landscape uh, photographer of the year in the southeast um, and I won the shot with a, an image of Brighton. Uh, the actual shot that won was, was a color version of this, but um, I was kind of more interested in showing the black and white version because I feel that it shows those, monoto uh, those mono monotone values that actually won me the, uh, the prize. It's very simplistic, but it has such a simple um, construction to it with a leading line to the old pier in Brighton. And then finally, the first image that I sold was this image. Um, this was taken in the Lake District, and uh, I sold one of these, I think about 2003. My first print, um, again, nothing spectacular, but uh, it, it, you know, it gives you a good feeling when you make your first sale. So that's my first sort of early influences. Um, I then moved to the UEE oh, about nine, nine years ago now. Um, so I'd kind of, I'd been a photographer for, as a hobby for about seven, seven or eight years in the UK. I played around with a bit of color, a lot of black and white. Um, but then I moved to the UAE and found a bit of a shock because there wasn't really much to, uh, to shoot in the way of big vistas, hills, mountains, things like that, unless you go outside of Dubai to places like Oman. So I started to look more architecturally and this shot was obviously in the mosque. Um, and I wanted to try to uh, build a portfolio really of images that was a different perspective of, of Dubai because uh, I think yeah, as mentioned earlier before this started that a lot of people were rooftopping, taking shots of the Burj, taking shots of the, uh, the, the obvious locations. Um, but I wanted to take some of shots of the, the obvious locations but in a slightly different way. Um, I wouldn't say it's that original because um, nothing necessarily is but um, I wanted to use the sort of black and white dodging and burning techniques that I'd learned uh, in the UK and put that into practice here. But rather than shooting the busy streets of Dubai, I wanted to kind of like reduce it down, make it a bit more intimate and shoot Dubai in the quieter times. So this was a Friday morning about 7 a.m. and it's called Before the Traffic because there's no boats and there's no people. Um, so you'd notice that the boats as well um, are sharp and that's because it was a 
it's not long exposure, but the boats weren't moving because there's zero wind. And uh, if you ever shoot in the summer in Dubai, um, it's usually likely that you get no wind early in the morning. So that was the idea, it was to try and find opportunities where I could take imagery um, of Dubai, but from different perspectives. So I called the actual um, collection, it was called Reflective Lands, because it was an idea that I was trying to reflect to the city in a different way, but also reflect the city in water. So that was the combination of the, the words, really. And this shot was, uh, was quite a lucky one, because I'd set up uh, just before sunset, and the, the wind was howling from the, the right-hand side through these bridges that you can see. And uh, there was no reflection at all. But literally, the sun fell behind the buildings that you can see on the horizon. Um, the light came on, and then the, the water just dissipated and just became this, this mirror-like reflection. So it's just always good to stay sometimes in a location. Even if you think the best light is gone, sometimes you can get something like this, even when the light has gone, and turn it black and white. And again, um, using the, uh, the weather conditions to my benefit, this was a summer shot, so middle of July in, in, the, you know, in the UAE is never a pleasant time, but um, what you don't get is wind in the summer, or much wind, uh, you get a lot less wind. Uh, if you can stand the heat, then you can go out and you can get shots like this, which is the Montgomery Golf Course. Uh, at sunset again and um, so again you're just looking for that zero wind to to give you this uh, reflective value so this image again was it was a morning shot and it took me probably about uh, five or six times to get it um, purely because the wind comes down the canal um, and it does really howl along that stretch of, of water because it's so flat so it's very difficult to get this kind of uh, reflective uh, shot. Yeah, a few people have said it, is it photoshopped? Yeah, it's photoshopped, but it's not photoshopped, if that makes sense. So I dodged and burned it in Photoshop, and I uh, upped the values, like the exposure slightly, but I didn't actually in any way change the, uh, the subject, which is the buildings and the reflection. That is all as it was seen in camera. So, and that's throughout my work. A lot of my work is, is honest work. I don't tend to go out into the field and try and get a shot, and if it hasn't, isn't quite right, and adjust it in Photoshop, I always try and get the, the shot in camera, and then just tweak it. Um, with, and you'll see my a slight a kind of insight into my editing later in the uh, presentation. So moving on a little bit, um, my kind of work started to progress a little bit. Uh, I wanted to explore minimalism more um, and simplicity. And this is really where the influences of these guys came into my life about six years ago. Uh, you've got Michael Levin in the top left, a uh, big influence on my color work. You've got Michael Kenner again, uh, the, guy, uh, the guy I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, you've got a guy called Jonathan Critchley, who is a, is a superb black and white minimalist landscape photographer. And a really interesting Toronto uh, photographer, or fine art photographer by the name of David Burdendy. All these guys have different styles, but they all follow a similar influence um, of color and composition. And that was really my kind of key in trying to sustain where I was going as a photographer was, was those two things, was style and composition. And if you can kind of like separate that and be honest about yourself and what you like, then you can start to become the photographer that you expect you should be. So I started to simplify everything completely and break down imagery into things like this, which to some people is just a bit of rock and a post. Um, but to me, it kind of like shouts less about location and more about emotion. Um, you know, it's a calming, relaxing kind of feel to it. And if you're getting that from the image, then it's working. Um, and that's the key. It's not about the location for me. It's more about the feel that somebody would get and the feel that I get. And when I take these images, if the shot when I'm taking it doesn't give me that feel when I'm shooting, then I won't process it because it has to correspond to how I feel when I'm shooting. And it normally, it, it, that normally is the case with most images that, that photographers take. Okay? If it doesn't feel right at the time, you normally get back and you'll get, you'll get it on your computer and you'll realize that you were right, but it doesn't look right either 
So I was kind of experimenting with structures or man-made structures in water with long exposure, um, trying to separate um, really these, these non-moving objects with moving objects, which is the water, and also trying to eliminate or at least try to dis take away the distraction of the, uh, of the horizon. So almost blending the horizon with the, uh, with the sky. Um, this shot, this is a, for me, very simple shot, but it was a breakthrough shot for me because it kind of made me understand how I can shoot simple shots, but make sure that there's still an element of composition there. And you could have shot these three sticks or three posts, however you want it. But if you think about this shot, um, there's three posts, which eventually will join into a V. So if you were to follow the line of the post down, on each of them, they join up as a V. Um, you also have the V or the, the diagonal line of the, the seaweed, um, which is the background, which, which dif differentiates the foreground and the background. The sharp horizon, the rule of thirds on the sky, um, again, balances the image because it's rule of thirds. It kind of makes it feel that little bit more balanced. Um, the line that's splitting the posts, which is the seaweed uh, borderline, if you look at the post on the left, it's halfway down the post. If you look at the post on the right, it's halfway down that post almost. So again, it's balance. Um, two of the posts do crop, do go through the sky horizon, which is a no-no, but it joins the sky to the water. It makes that, it makes it feel as if it has some connection. Um, and lastly, the vignette around the edges, so the top vignette and the bottom vignette, draws the eye to the center post, which has also been slightly lightened or exposure has been increased to bring the eye into that middle post. And then the eye spirals from that central post to everything else in the image. So as simple as that shot is, it isn't simple. Um, it wasn't just a matter of finding three posts and taking a shot of it. It was, it was a matter of working out how I can take this to make it look like something interesting. And that's the crucial thing about um, minimalism. Again, with this shot, I'm not gonna go through the, the, the ins and outs of this one, but finding something different. Um, this is in Dubai. Um, I wanted to shoot things that were not necessarily recognizable as Dubai. That could have been shot anywhere in the world, but um, again, it's, it's, it's unusual. It's uh, something you've never seen before. And that was really the idea. This one you have seen before, um, and unfortunately they've built an island now opposite the palm, so you can't get this uninterrupted view. But I'm messing around with long exposure, so I'm trying to eliminate distraction from the water and almost let it merge with the sky. Um, again, that was a, an intentional thing. And I started to look at bridges, I started to look at other man-made structures, and I, I, start, I got a lot obsessed with bridges for about six months. Um, but, you know, it, it actually was uh, intriguing to sort of see what different kind of results you can get. And sometimes the water would be dark, sometimes the water would be dark with light patches like this one. And again, I'm still using black and white as my main tonality, so I'm not using colour at this point. Uh, I haven't entered into that kind of realm yet. But uh, and I'm still using the, uh, the reflections as well as interest within the work. But this particular image actually got me uh, a commercial job. So uh, it managed to get me a job with LG. And it was one of my first big commercial jobs as a photographer, maybe about five years ago. Um, and it was quite a large project, it's a two month project. And I worked with another photographer called Danny Heed, who you may know. And we worked together on this one. Um, and we ended up sort of taking shots like this. And this is a shot of uh, a washing machine in the same location, but on the other side of the river. Or the, the creek. So it just goes to show you that um, you know if you're if you're uh, if you're shooting and you're posting and you're and you're putting your work out there that uh, even big companies like LG can can come finding you. Um, you know even when you think it's not going to be relevant to a company like that, then they may find they they may differ. They may think it's it's, it's actually relevant to their company. So desert then started to interest me because I I kind of done a lot of architectural. Um, photography and I wanted to go back to my roots which was more landscape um, because you know it was really what I'm about was more landscape as a child my first when I first picked up a camera it was more about landscape and I started shooting it first in black and white this is just a an old piece of wood uh, an old tree that's obviously been maybe uh, used for firewood I'm not sure but uh, it was just something that just kind of took 
you call my iron and just took it and there's a big storm over Dubai so I managed to kind of shoot that with a filter on, on the camera and it kind of gave you this stuff. It almost uh, looks like a cat. Exactly and a few people have mentioned that. <laughs> good, good observation. It, it does. I mean um, it looks like a little cat poking up with two ears. You can see the two ears on the top. Um, and when I exhibited this shot in Dubai in D3 that was exactly one of the comments someone made. So good observation there. So again, I was, I was looking uh, at how I could use the desert and how I could shoot the desert slightly differently. And my way of shooting the desert right from the start was all about lighting conditions. And a lot of people like to shoot deserts in the morning and in the evening because you get the contrast of the dunes. You're getting the harshness from one side of the dune, which is going to give you shadow. And then you get the light or the warmth of the light on the other side of the dune, which is completely, makes complete technical sense. Um, I wanted to shoot deserts in cloudy weather, which, as you know, if you live in Dubai, doesn't always happen often, which made it a little bit more special. Um, and also it gives you more of filtered light rather than a, um, a harsh light. So it kind of simplifies the shadows, which is what my work's more about. So I started to do more of that and colour started to come into the work um, a little bit more because I think with deserts, you need to have that warmth. Um, I'll show you this one as an example. If you were to change that into black and white, it would be very, very boring. It would just be tone. Um, it could have been a snow scene. It could have been, you know, it could have been mounds of, of earth. It could have been anything in black and white. But in colour, you know straight away that it's sand dunes. And that's the difference is that colour, if you're going to go really simple and really minimalist, then colour adds that extra little bit of something to give the viewer the story behind the image. Uh, and so I decided at this point, really, which was again about four years, five years ago, that I wanted to do more colour imagery. Um, and this was one of the first images that I did it in. Um, and it's, I've sold a few prints of this one as well. So it, it, it has that kind of um, emotional connection to some people as well, obviously. So I'm going to show you um, how I go from a raw file in the desert in colour to how it ends. And the, I won't go through in depth the editing technique because obviously this isn't live on Photoshop, but I can just kind of give you an insight into the simple things that I do to an image in order to make it what I want it to be. So I would start with a raw file, obviously, and this was a, a really, really overcast day and it was so dusty. Um, my, my camera bag was full of sand by the end of the shoot, um, but I managed to get some really different shots. And some people might know where this is, uh, it's Al-Qudra. So I, I started to process some of the images and I would always go with a bit of contrast first because with the, the haze in the air, you, you really need to bump the contrast up. So add a bit of contrast, but obviously as everyone else would do, you add a bit of black and you adjust the whites to make sure that the exposure is starting to um, penetrate the, the shadows and the highlights. And then you add a bit of dehaze because on that particular day there was a lot of dust in the air so I needed to add a bit of dehaze just to kind of sharpen those trees. Um, saturation has already started to drop off as you can see. I, I don't like too much saturation in my images so you'll see that a lot in my later work. Cloning cleanup. So previously you had all the distraction in the front of the image. I cloned it all out. And that's about as much cloning as I'll do. Uh, I'll never clone out a tree or I'll never clone out a sand dune. I will always be honest to the original raw file. And I'm a big fan of removing distractions um, because you know, if there's a big rock or there's, there's a number of rocks in the foreground, you know, there's no harm in moving those. And yes, okay, it's part of the image, but it's just distracting the eye. It's taking your eye away from the subject, which is the four trees. And then I will tweak the hue. So I'll adjust the hue slightly just to kind of warm up those sand dunes. And then I'll add filters. Um, I add filters to the sky for obvious reasons because the sky is always going to be, majority of the time, it's going to be lighter than the, uh, than the foreground and the background. And then I'll also add a, a gradient filter to the, front, the foreground. And the reason I do that is to bring the eye into the subject. So now you see a strip. Your eye is going straight to those four trees in the middle, but it's also adding a bit of mood to the image is the, is the gradient filter. So it's doing two jobs there. Um, and reducing the highlights as well in the sky if there are any. And then finally, obviously, I'll sharpen the image. And this is, you know, it's not, so, not necessarily a finished image because um, I did this prior to the presentation. I had to just put all these slides together. 
But um, you know, the finished image isn't far off this particular image that I'm showing you here. Uh, but it just gives you a small insight of the small amount of work that I do to the images and, and how important it is to get it right in your camera rather than in Photoshop. Because if you get it right in camera, the exposure, the composition, the subject, the conditions, the light, everything like that, then it's going to make your job that, that much easier when you come to edit your image. So I'm going to show you one more example, a couple more examples of, of high process. This is just going to be a transition. So it's just going to dissolve the top image and it will show you the finished image very quickly. But um, this is a raw file of a, of a, of a lighthouse actually in the UK, um, which was using uh, long exposure. <clears throat> so I think it was a three minute long exposure. And I was quite careful not to blow the highlights out on the left hand side because the sun was starting to rise just out of shot. So I couldn't go too long with the ND filter on my camera, so I knew I'd blow those highlights out. Hence the water's slightly dark and the, you know, the, the shadows are slightly dark. There's a bit of a distraction in the bottom right hand corner, uh, which I kind of thought at first might be interesting, but it's really not. So I click the button and you get the, the finished image, which is more pastely, um, it's more alive. Uh, the water is sharper, cleaner, uh, slightly lighter, because obviously the, uh, it's slightly underexposed before. Uh, again, the, 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 the color in the sky is a little bit more realistic to what I saw in my own eyes, because a, a raw fire will always look quite flat, uh, and you'll always notice that compared to your eyes. Next shot is uh, the one you've seen already. It's um, a black and white shot that I did, and this is the color raw file. So the raw file of this one is um, it's pretty similar to the, the finished product. The difference being that the whites and the blacks, when I turn it into a black and white, are a lot more contrasty because I was doing some dodgy, dodging and burning. So I'll, I'll flip the change and you'll see the difference. Um, I go back to the original. The buildings, there's a bit of perspective warp there, so the buildings are leaning in slightly, so I have to adjust that as well uh, with perspective warp in Photoshop. But um, straighten the buildings up, turn it into a black and white, and then dodge and burn all the whites and the blacks, and that's what you get. Um, not much work. I mean, again, a lot of people think that's uh, HDR or, you know, there's a lot of other techniques involved. Pretty simple techniques. Um, nothing special, nothing uh, you know, over the top either. So this is going to give you a, a bit more. Hi, Anthony. Hi there. I have a question. Uh, in the previous, uh, previous picture, can you tell me which parts did you dodge and which parts did you burn? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think... You, you can't dodge and burn what you feel is going to be uh, necessary. So you see all the, the, the buildings, obviously. Uh, they have a lot of white on those buildings. So I would literally brush over the majority of those with a brush tool or um, the dodge or burn tool. I always get them mixed up, which one is. Um, and you would set the, the dodge and the burn tool to only 1%. So you're not really affecting the image too much. You're slowly but surely bringing those highlights out. So, yeah, I mean, it's a question that really a lot of the image, I would say a lot of the whites, for example, have definitely been, uh, definitely been dodged. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the black in the water in particular and the shadows in the buildings have been, have been burned. So, um, yeah, I mean, very good question. But I think you have to, if you do something similar like this yourself, I think it's really important to, to slowly go about changing the image. And definitely you should be duplicating the layer so you're not affecting the original negative. Uh, because if you make a mistake, then you can just mask it off. So you mean uh, to say you use uh, luminosity masks and all that? I, I do on some images, yes. Okay. Um, not, not on this one though. This was literally a duplication. So I, I took the original, this original file. Um, I adjusted the perspective warp to bring the buildings into play. And then I, I use something called gradient map to change it to black and white. So that will change it to the black and white that you see. Um, and then I would literally duplicate the layer uh, once for dodging and then second for burning. Um, and then slowly with a, I use uh, one of these, uh, one of these pen tools. Uh, I would literally go over all the white areas and then all the black areas. I did put a gradient on the sky. I mean, there's obviously, there's an obvious gradient on the sky as well. Um, and you, can do, you could use luminosity masks on a gradient now in Photoshop, which makes things a lot easier. But um, on this image, which was done quite a few years ago, 
I, I wasn't really that good at luminosity master back in those days. Um, so no, it was, it was just purely dodging and burning, which is a laborious task sometimes, but you know, it doesn't take that long. You'd be surprised that you can do things relatively quickly as long as you don't overdo it. Um, that's the most important thing is keep it real. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through um, sort of me, my, my style really, because uh, you, you've seen how I progressed into color. You've seen how I've um, sort of shot simplistic architectural shots. Um, you know, now it's really about where do I go from there? You know, how do I achieve the results that I want to achieve? And this image I think kind of sums it up because it's got long exposure in it, which was a big, which I'm a big fan of. Um, it gives texture in the sky, it, gives te it reduces texture in the water. It's got a subtle, but still it has color in it, which is slightly subdued or desaturated. It's got architectural elements, so it's got graphic elements, which again goes all the way back to my interest in design. Um, it's got balance, so it's rule of thirds. It's got the central uh, hut in the middle, which is a different size to the others, and it's in the middle of the, the shot. Um, it's also got the balance of the sky, which is going from left to right uh, because of the wind, and also the water or the sandbar that I'm stood on goes from right to left, or left to right as well. So it kind of mirrors the, uh, the sky, just the sandbar, which again offers that balance that you look for. Um, and simplicity. Um, breaking an image down or breaking a, a scene down into something that is just a line of buildings. Um, and using all those elements together can give you something that is slightly different to just a, a, a very nice vista shot of some, of some huts. You know, this, is, this, is, uh, this has been on the Lee Filters website. Lee Filters used this um, for, a, for a campaign. Uh, to promote their, their, their graduated filters and um, it also has won a competition or two. So it's, um, it's one of my favorites because uh, it, it's led me down the route that I'm now on because um, of, of all those different elements that, that sort of fit into the, the composition. This again um, breaks some rules does this shot and this is another reason I've, I've put it into the, the presentation because don't be frightened of breaking rules. Um, even if you break rules, you can still get good looking shots. Um, the reason this breaks rules is because it's central and it's not on a third, it's right bang in the middle of the shot. Um, also, the tree is, is, is pushing straight over that horizon line, which is a big no-no. If you go to university and study photography, they'll say, no, you can't do that. You can never do that. But I think, well, why? What's the reason why I can't do that? Okay, it might not be aesthetically pleasing, but you know, sometimes it will work because it's going to bounce against the sky, which is what those branches are doing. It's, it's the contrast between the white of the sky and the, the dark of the branches um, brings your eye towards that tree. Um, and this was just in the middle of a sandstorm again. It's the sort of weather I love because uh, it's blowing right across the, the dunes or the, the plain. It's a, it's a flat plain actually here. And it gives you the effect of movement. So all the, the sand is just blowing in these horizontal lines which is like layering almost, which leads your eye through the scene. Very simple technique um, of, of layering or very simple technique of composition. So again, another simple technique, perspective and balance and symmetry um, and rule of thirds. So I'm using very similar uh, composition techniques throughout my work, but choosing the right angle, looking at the subject, shooting it from different angles and then finding the angle that I prefer and then starting the process of, of long exposure. Um, using the sky as well as, as negative space. So using that negative space as, as a way of bringing or drawing the eye towards the main subject. And it's almost floating in the picture as this shot. Um, it, it's, sorry, it's this pier. It's an old pier in, um, in the UK. And then some dunes. Um, I won't go too much into some of these other pictures, we need to sort of move through these, but uh, this is all about light. The raw file is very similar to the original, to this finished shot. Um, this is all about waiting for the light. Uh, the blue in the sky is actually a storm right in the horizon. Um, and I used a 70 to 200 millimeter lens to, to really compact the shot. And I focus stacked it, so I had to actually take two shots. Uh, one of the, the dune in the foreground, and then a second shot of the dunes in the, uh, in the mid and the, and the background. And then I had to blend them in Photoshop. 
and then I, I got this this shot. So this was all about just the hidden shrub, uh, the little shrub right in the middle of those dunes is all about that single thing, and the rest of it is sculptural, and the rest of it is just is just tone. That's all it is. Uh, this is Maldives, so um, again, I just found some swings, and this was about timing as well, uh, breaking rules, putting the horizon in the middle, um, but I wanted to do that for a number of reasons. Um, I wanted foreground, which is the, the, the bottom of the image where the sand is, and the, the, low, tide, the, well, the low tide that was going coming in at the time, and uh, if you see this in full resolution, you'll see all the detail of the shells and the sand in the foreground of the image. Um, and if the, if the water had been any lower or any higher, the shot wouldn't have worked because the, it was a long exposure of three minutes. So if it had been higher, then it would have disrupted the swing on the left and it would have moved that swing all around and it would have been blurred. And if it had been lower, the water, then all the rocks on the back, in the background or behind the swing would have been uh, visible and they're not, they're underwater. So the simplicity of this shot comes from timing. Um, and working out the best time to shoot it. And it just so happens to be sunset as well, which is pretty lucky um, in terms of timing. So recent work, this is just gonna go through a little bit of work really that I've been doing more recently in breaking down the reasons why I'm, I'm doing it. And um, so you've seen the kind of progression of, of my work from black and white to color, from architectural to simplicity and long exposure, and really breaking down um, elements of of what's in front of you in the landscape. And this is a, an Abu Dhabi shot. This is, in, uh, this is on Sadia Island, actually, right near to a big, busy road. You wouldn't believe it. Um, and it's just a singular tree. And that shot is there for anyone to take. And I just drove past it one day and saw it and thought, yeah, that looks like quite a cool, quite a cool location. Um, but it's right next to this busy road. It's not as calming as it really looks. It's actually the opposite. Um, but um, it's amazing what you can do uh, with just simplicity. It, it, it gives you a different vibe or emotion. Um, so these, these shots that are mostly Abu Dhabi actually, um, are just sort of showing you the tonal value of how I use colour as well. You don't need much colour uh, to, to, to share the story of what you're shooting. And I always tend to shoot uh, in cloudy conditions or in, in the morning light, because that's my preferred, my preferred time. So um, everyone's different. And some people prefer to do uh, you know, sunsets and things like that. But I like to go with subtle lights rather than um, sort of really bright colored light. Can I ask something, Anthony? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, about the Abu Dhabi shot. Uh, do you need the permission to put your tripod? Uh, this this shot here yes exactly so i spoke yeah good good question because i don't want to get anyone in trouble here i spoke to the guy um there's a security guard there even from well, five in the morning um there's a security security guard on a segway um from touring around on a segway to making sure that there's no one there and you do need permission to take a shot of this so don't expect to be able to just turn up on the day with your tripod and your camera gear and shoot this because you'll get thrown up the complex. Um, I spoke to the security guard and the head of security to get these shots. I was given an hour, so only one hour to shoot, and then they opened. So they didn't want me to be there when people were coming into the uh, into the actual location. So good good question actually, because you know it's not a good idea to go and um, you know to places that you're not supposed to be shooting without permission. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. This one, I didn't need permission from the camel for this one though. So he was quite, uh, he was quite a nice uh, camel. Um, I actually shot this with a, with a friend of mine who I think is on the, uh, I'm gonna shout out a guy called Wan. He's one of my fellow photographers. Um, he's a street photographer, but we decided to go out and shoot some camels. And this is one of the shots I took when I was with him. And it was the first time I'd really got the opportunity to shoot camels in the desert. Yeah, I'd seen camels in the desert before, but I'd never really had the open space or the, the kind of subject and the broader backdrop to, to really promote what they're all about. And this kind of tells the story really of its habitat um, in a simple way. And it looks like it's posing. It actually was walking, um, but the fast shutter speed obviously you can get, um, you can get shot. So I was using a new camera with a, with a pretty, uh, about 50 mil lens I think. So it wasn't a zoom lens or anything. Um, 
not an easy shot to get when they're moving around, but uh, if you take enough shots, sometimes you get lucky. And again, the, the, the simplicity, it's, it's all about where the placement of the subject and where you place subjects. And with this one, I wanted to place it at the bottom of the dunes, but if you look at the dunes, there's a leading line which comes down um, to the tree. And that again is down to positioning. Um, consciously, when you look at the picture, you don't see that line, um, but it is there. And it has been consciously put there in the composition. So it is there for a reason because it takes you into the dunes from the tree and it also brings you back to the tree from the dunes. So if you're going to shoot minimalism, it's really important to think carefully about how you're going to shoot a composition. Don't just shoot a singular tree and expect to get a good result. You have to make sure that all the balance is there because um, without the balance and, or the symmetry or the leading lines or whatever else you want to impose on that composition, you might not get the results that you're looking for. So it's really important to try to break it down into bite-sized chunks and, uh, and that way, hopefully, you can, you can get some um, images you're happy with. Is this uh, Liwa or uh, Maliha? It's actually fossil rock. Fossil uh, rock, okay. Yeah, believe it or not. Um, you won't get, I mean, this, this has a serious amount of cloning. I know I didn't do a lot of cloning, in, uh, I don't do a lot of cloning normally, but there's a lot of four by fours in the winter on this particular June. So you will, if you, you will be disappointed if you shoot this in winter. If you shoot this in summer, you will get less tracks behind this tree. Uh, but it's fossil rock and it's a, it's a great place for you know, finding singular subjects like this. True. It's a very, very uh, secluded and beautiful place. Yeah. It is, it is, it is. But go, go at the right time. You want to go early in the morning as well, get away from the crowds. <laughs> The, the, the sand dunes look like it, it's, it's a painting. So is it because of the cloning you have done there? Or no, is it an effect you have? It's, it looks like a painting because the light, uh, partly, it was overcast. So there was no direct sunlight at all on these dunes, none at all. It was filtered light. And that, that's one of the things that I think I really do champion is, is, this, is this filtered light. It has to be the right kind of light because... If you go out and it's a stormy day, you won't quite get that filtered light. You'll get just dullness. Um, but I, I was waiting. I was using a, a long lens. I was waiting for the, the cloud to thin slightly. So then the whole scene turns into like a light box and you get this filtered light on the dunes. And okay, yes, I have um, slightly emphasized it, bringing out the whites and dropping down the shadows, which is the opposite of what people normally do. People normally drop the highlights and bring the shadows out. Well, I actually flip it around and I, I want to darken the shadows in the dunes and bring the highlights in those dunes out so you can see the contextual contrast between that and the, the tree. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, but it hasn't been like, H, I mean, if you looked at the raw file, and I kind of wish I'd put this on here, but if you look at the raw file, it's not far off um, because the majority of the work's been done by the light and I'm just emphasizing that light. But thanks and, for the question. Uh, and what is the lens used here? Like 7200 or? 7200, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm a quite a big fan of it with, with my compositions because it, com it compresses uh, and, it com and it simplifies. Right, um, right. You know what I mean? So I think I used to use 16 to 12. Well, I used to use a very wide, a very wide angle when I first started shooting as a landscape photographer. And then I moved to 2470, and now I'm more 70 to 200. Um, but I, fl I flirt between, you know, lenses, Not normally between focal lens of about 24 to about 150 is my main area of focus. True. Even when I uh, shoot mountains, uh, for example, in Himalaya, etc., I always yeah. prefer to have a 7200 because, as you told, it uh, simplifies and secondly, it compresses. It's a very Definitely. beautiful effect. Yeah. No, for sure, buddy, for sure. But, um, also, did you have a filter on this? Was it a long exposure or was it just a straight shot? This was a straight shot. So, yeah, I, I don't tend to do any long exposures in the desert. Not because I don't think it would be um, complimentary, because actually with, the, with, with clouds and things like that, you can really get some texture. Um, but, but for this kind of shot, it was just a, uh, a... Yeah, I don't think I used any filters. I used a gradient filter in post-processing for the top and the bottom but no filters on camera for this one. Okay. All right, so this, um, this sort of leads me really into some, some recent stuff I've been experimenting with. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily happy with this photograph because I'm, I put it on here though because 
I want to show you where I'm heading as a photographer because this is about my journey. Um, and I'm really now trying to break down image into, you know, completely into emotion. So what I'm trying to do now is I've got, I was going to be going to Scotland in June, fortunately, you know, like a lot of people, we can't travel at the moment, which is totally understandable. Um, but at the same time, um, it means that, you know, I can maybe go at a different time of year, which might be better for weather. Uh, so the idea of me going to Scotland was to try and get images of nothing, pretty much, of, of, of colour and tone. And that's what this image is really about. It's more about just colour and tone. It's not about subject because there's nothing in it apart from just dust and sand and rocks and that's it. But it, I wanted to shoot these shots because um, they show a storm, a shamal, um, and a shamal to me is quite an important part of Dubai as a, as a place. Um, and I was shooting these, these images really to try and promote an emotion about the, the wind and about the, the conditions. Um, and it's, it's about the subject of the actual wind, if that makes sense, rather than the subject of what you see. Uh, the movement is telling more of a story. Um, I like with the light exposure. You know, the light exposure shows you more of an ethereal emotion than it does a subject. And that's what this does. The, the wind is, is blowing the, sky, the, the dust and the sand into the air and it's just making this really unusual sort of painterly effect of, of, of sand. Um, and then the other sort of project that I'm looking at doing as well is, um, is again going back to my roots, is going back to simplicity, but maybe bringing a bit of human element in. Um, when I last did this uh, presentation, one of the questions was, you know, do you ever shoot people? And I don't. I, I, I started to do a bit more work with, uh, with people, but I, I don't really feel comfortable shooting people. Um, this shot has got a single person, I don't know if you can see them, but it's a single person, so I call this piece uh, Living Statue because this is a long exposure of about four minutes and the guy didn't move an inch. Um, so good on him. I don't know if he was on his phone or if he was meditating, I'm not quite sure, but uh, one or the other. Hopefully he was meditating. Um, but it was in Bali and it was just one of those shots. And I want to try to kind of incorporate maybe more people into my work. So this is, again is, is part of the journey and evolving as a photographer to, to try and bring that uh, human element in. And I've also been looking at uh, structures, so infrastructure in the desert. So I'm actually doing a, I've been working on a, um, a series or collection of work called Human Element, which has got now about 12 shots in it. And this is one of them. Um, this is, you know this, most people know this place now. It's, it's quite well known. It's an Al-Qudra and it's a cycling track. Very well shot place now. But um, I was shooting this six years ago and before the barbecue started happening in the desert to the left. Um, but it's a beautiful place and I do recommend going. Um, and it's quite a nice photogenic place as well. But it's just sort of, again, showing how man interacts with, with nature. Uh, but you can still get that balance, that, 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 you know, that sort of the, the soft touch if you do it well. Uh, coming to the previous picture. Yes, mate. Uh, why did you uh, not clone those uh, lampposts? Like, is there any reason behind yeah. that? Yeah, good question. Um, I didn't do it because I, I didn't want to do that because I felt it had, there was an element of perspective with them in. Uh, without them, if you took them out, it would be quite flat and it would, the, the balance from the left-hand side would be the same as the right-hand side. So there'll be no different, there's no differentiator. And I kind of liked it because the dunes on the left, the height of the dunes on the left is, is higher than the height of the dunes on the right. But when you put, bring in the perspective of the, the wires, it kind of balances. So the height of the dunes then becomes similar to the height of the, the wires. Um, and I just quite like that human side, that sort of, yeah, here's some wires. And yeah, I, I wanted to be honest. And that's really what my work's all about is honesty. Um, most people would probably clone it out. But then if you went there and you shot it yourself, you'd know that that person cloned it out. Oh, they cloned it out, it's cheating. It's not necessarily cheating because you're just kind of making it nicer. But yeah, I don't tend to, to, to remove things unless I really have to. Got but a good question. But uh, I also wonder, uh, have you not uh, started using uh, drones? Yeah, good. again, uh, drones for me, um, I have to because uh, Kudra is one of the most uh, 
you know, like drone friendly places in UAE. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. And I've, I've, I've seen a few. Um, I don't know what it is about June, uh, June's, drones. Um, I think it's the fact that I'm, I don't think I'll be a very good pilot. I don't know. I, I mean, I, uh, I've, um, I've never flown one. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of a lot of work with of people, and it's beautiful. I mean, I especially like the deltas over Iceland, and you know, the, the dunes at sunset from above are beautiful from a drone. From a drone. Um, but it's you know, aerial photography for me has never been in my portfolio, and um, I think you want to maybe so maybe you want to try to maybe it's because I want to stick to a particular genre of photography. Maybe, maybe that's just me being a bit old school. I don't, I don't know, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got friends who are, who are photographers and they, they do a lot of aerial stuff and I have nothing against it whatsoever, but um, I suppose it's just not me, that's all. Got it. Good question. Got it. So just to, I mean, we're, we're nearly at the end really of, of the presentation, but, um, you know, jump in with questions at the end if you want to as well, feel free. But again, this is combining elements of, of human element with the, the, love, the weather that I love, which is a the storms, you know, the, the blowing of the, the sand across the roads gives you this slightly different element, which is unusual. Um, on this shot, I have actually cloned out a couple of trees. So, um, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, I don't always stick to the rules, but I mean, like I said, right at the beginning of the presentation, rules are there to be broken. So you can do whatever you want as a creative. Um, so lastly, people. Um, and I'm not, a, I'm, I'm showing you this, and I'm a bit nervous about it because I don't ever shoot people. Um, but just to prove to people out there, do I shoot people? I've just included two images. Um, I'm not sure about them, but uh, you know, it, it's a, a trip that I did with, with Juan, who I mentioned earlier, and uh, he introduced me to this. It still holds your signature. Say that again, buddy. It still holds your signature, I said. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it sort of holds elements of, of stuff that, that I, you know, simplicity, it still holds desaturation, it still holds, you know, all the kind of things that I look for in, in a piece of work. And, you know, I'm not all of a sudden going to jump into uh, documentary photography because it's not, it's not necessarily me, but one for the, this is another one that I shot, which tells you all about the, the coronavirus. This is the beginning of the, the coronavirus. Um, and this is just, again, a trip that we, we went on and we were searching around the creek for some opportunities to do a workshop. And these guys are always really grateful. As long as you ask them if it's okay to shoot them, they're, they're really friendly people. And uh, obviously always show them uh, the imagery afterwards because it puts a smile on their face. But um, these guys work so hard and a lot of them are Iranians. And uh, yeah, they, they do. Uh, they do bringing a lot of uh, goods uh, for, for all of us to, uh, to put things on our table. So, um, yeah, I mean, this was, just, I thought I'd finish with, with these images just to kind of uh, shout out to any doubters maybe that uh, I, I, I sometimes do shoot people, but it, it really is out of my comfort zone. And I'm certainly not going to be going down that route of um, portraiture. Um, I think I'll stick to the landscape, but uh, just if, uh, if there was any questions about that, it, it answers those questions for you guys. So lastly, uh, we've come to the end of the, the imagery and the presentation of the, the shots. Um, I'm just going to go through the question at the beginning, or I say it's the question, it's the quote. And the quote was, your first 10,000 photographs are your worst. And a lot of people take a lot of images nowadays because it's digital and it's throwaway. You don't have to worry. But I'm very selective. So... I thought I'd put how many digital negatives on my, on my computer. And this is only digital negatives from my digital SLRs, not my phone, not my handheld Sony, um, which, I, which I use for family um, albums and things like that. This is just my professional camera that I use in the field. And you'd be surprised. I've only shot 24,000 or just over 24,000 images. And it doesn't include film either, because I used to shoot film when I was at college. Um, so it's not a lot, it's not a lot of images. I mean, a lot of people, when I did this presentation in Madeira, they said, oh, maybe 50,000, 60,000, 100,000. And 
I, I'm quite I'm quite picky when it comes to imagery, um, so I don't shoot a lot when I go out into the field. So over 16 years, it's only 1,500 images per year. Okay, bearing in mind, I've only been a professional photographer, well, not all that time. Um, so, you know, a lot of the time I was, it was a hobby more than a profession, but still, it's not a lot of images. Um, and only about 85 of those images are actually in my portfolio. Um, so, 0.5%, which is nothing, which is nothing at all. So, most came, I said it says all came after having taken 10,000, but actually, there's actually two images that I, I have actually taken before the 10,000. And it's interesting because even before I'd taken 10,000 images, I still sold images or prints. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they were bad images. It just means that you're gonna be getting yourself in a more of a comfortable position where you feel like you're producing the work that is maybe honest to you. I don't think it's about good or bad, or you know, not a very good photographer, a really great photographer. It's not about that, it's more about finding your own journey as a photographer or your genre, whether it's portrait, whether it's landscape, whether it's street, whether it's architecture, finding your style, finding if it's an emotional connection or if it's a location connection. You know, it's finding about all these things that then add up to produce photographs that I feel are more honest and more, maybe more um, in tune to what you feel you are about as a person. And this is all about personal constructive feedback, not from other people. This is not other people saying, oh, all your pictures before 10,000 are rubbish. This is about you as a photographer thinking the more effort you put in, the more likely it is that you're going to basically become, uh, you know, more comfortable with your work. So what does it mean? Well, it means I need a new hard drive because obviously I've got a lot of images on my computer. Does it mean I need to shoot 50K images plus to build a portfolio? No. It means you must practice, practice, and practice, which is the key word. And um, it's basically building a confidence, it's building a style, and it's building identity. And putting yourself out there enough, and nature will do the rest. So the more you get out with that camera, the more likely it is that you're going to get more confident with it. You're going to um, get the shots that you're looking for because of the weather conditions. Um, and you're also going to start to understand exactly what you're heading or the way your journey's heading as a photographer. And it can take you anywhere. It can take you into professional photography. It can take you into making some money out of it if that's something else you want to do. It can really it can offer you insight. If the more effort that you put in, it can open up doors. So that's pretty much it, guys. Um, and I'm going to open up the, you know, the thing to questions if anybody has any other questions other than the ones we've already had please uh questions anyone 